I'm reading this morning from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 5. The word says, Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Amen. Our God is a loving God. He's the only true God, and we're here today to worship him. Would you please pray a prayer with me? Would you humble your heart and lift up your hearts and your voices together? And let us go to the Lord and let us pray together. Would you pray with me in the name of Jesus? Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we humble ourselves before you, for we know that you are God Almighty, creator of all the heavens and the earth. There is no other Lord. You are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you are holy and righteous, and we are sinners. Lord, we have rebelled. We have sinned, Lord. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we claim the blood of Jesus. We know, Jesus, that you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Lamb of God who died to take our sins. And your Spirit lives with us because you are raised in the power of the Holy Spirit and you're alive today. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, you are alive in us and we know who you are. Please help us, Lord. Help us to worship you now in spirit. Help us to do what you would have us to do for your glory. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you for every soul that's here today and every family that's represented, Lord. Would you bless them, Lord, as only you can. Bless us, Lord, with your presence, with your Holy Spirit. Bless us, Lord, with your love and your mercy and grace. Bless us, Lord, as only you, because you are God Almighty. Help us, Lord, to empty ourselves and give our attention, to give our hearts to you. Help us, Lord, to put away the world. May we have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day. And may it, Lord, all be from our hearts to glorify and please you. For you are our God. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I will sing of my Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. Of the joy of cross He suffered from the church to set me free. Sing of sing of my Redeemer, the with His blood He purchased me. On the cross, he filled my pardon, I paid the dead and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story, how my Lord is saved to save. In his boundless love and mercy, he's a ransom freely gave. For where the blood he purchased me On the cross he fell my pardon I paid the dead and made me free I will praise my dear Redeemer And his praise of the town Till the victory he gave up over sin and death and hell, a thing of sin that finally remembered to wear this blood he purchased me. On the cross he filled my pardon, I paid the dead and made me free. I will sing of my redeemer. And it's heaven's love 
to me. Me from death to life have brought me. Father God with help to be. Say no sin about the dreamer where the blood he purchased me. On the cross he filled my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. Amen. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, a beautiful situation, the joy of the whole is Mount Zion on the side of the north of the city of the great city. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah for the city of the great city. What's the name, please? Great is the Lord and great in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful situation, the joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion on the side of the north of the city of the great city. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, a thing, hallelujah, for the city of the great king. Sing hallelujah, a thing, hallelujah, a thing, hallelujah, sing hallelujah, the city of the great king. Amen. Praise the Lord. Stand with me and we're going to go to the Lord and worship. I ask that you repeat after me, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, and please be seated. As you're taking your seats, we'll turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. This morning it's Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Sister Wazel will read for us in the Korean language. Sister Wazel, please. 하나님께서 주신 오늘의 말씀입니다. 에스겔 37장 1절에서 14절입니다. 여호와께서 근능으로 내게 임재하시고 그의 영으로 나를 데리고 가서 골짜기 가운데 두셨는데 거기 뼈가 가득하더라 나를 그뼈 사방으로 지나가게 하시기로 먼저 그 골짜기 지면에 뼈가 심이 많고 아주 말랐더라 그가 내게 이르시되 인자야 이 뼈들이 능히 살수 있겠느냐 하시기로 내가 대답하되 주여와여 주께서 아시나이다 또 내게 이르시되 너는 이 모든 뼈에게 대원하여 이르기를 너희 마른 뼈들아 여와의 말씀을 들을지어다 주 여호와께서 이 뼈들에게 이같이 말씀하시기를 내가 생기를 너희에게 들어가게 하리니 너희가 살아나리라 너희 위에 힘줄을 두고 살을 입히고 가죽으로 덮고 너희 속에 생기를 넣으리니 너희가 살아나리라 또 내가 여호와인 줄 너희 관리라 하셨다 하라 이에 내가 명령을 따라 대원하니 대원할 때에 소리가 나고 움직이며 이 뼈, 저 뼈가 들어맞아 뼈들이 서로 연결되더라 내가 또 보니 그 뼈에 힘줄이 생기고 살이 오르며 그 위에 가죽이 덮이나 그 속에 생기는 없더라 또 내게 이르시되 인자야 너는 생기를 향하여 대원하라 생기에게 대원하여 이르기를 주 여호와께서 이같이 말씀하시기를 생기야 사방에서부터 와서 이 죽음을 당한 자에게 불어서 살아나게 하라 하셨다 하라 이에 내가 그 명령대로 대원하였더니 
생기가 그들에게 들어가며 그들이 곧 살아나시 일어나서는데 극히 큰 군대들아 또 내게 이르시되 인자야 이 뼈들은 이스라엘 온 족석이라 그들이 이르기를 우리의 뼈들이 말랐고 우리의 소망이 없어졌으니 우리는 다 멸절되었다 하느니라 그러므로 너는 대어나여 그들에게 이르기를 주여와께서 이같이 말씀하시기를 내 백성들아 내가 너희 무덤을 열고 너희로 거기에서 나오게 하고 이스라엘 땅으로 들어가게 하리라 내 백성아, 백성들아 내가 너희 무덤을 열고 너희로 거기에서 나오게 한저 내는 내가 요하인 줄을 알리라 내가 또내 영혼 너희 속에 두어 너희가 살아나게 하고 내가 또 너희를 너희 고국 땅에 두리니 나 요하가 이 일을 말하고 이른 줄을 너희가 알리라 요하의 말씀이니라 아멘 Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say... Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this, your holy word. I thank you for this message. I thank you, Lord, for these people who are here to receive it, and those who hear it wherever they are, I pray for them, Lord, that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Give them a spirit to receive it, Lord, a spirit of wisdom and understanding. Help us, Lord. We all need to draw near to you through this, your holy word. For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hope. This morning, I think we can certainly say we have hope. You know, there was a time not too awful long ago when I was looking forward in the Bible and looking to what was coming up, and I, there's a song that I grew up with, uh, them, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. I, I wanted to sing that so bad this morning, uh, it's, uh, and, and I was going to sing it with Brother Jasper, but he's sick and he can't sing, so you'll have to wait till later. Boy, you guys are very lucky that we're not singing it to y'all this morning, but we will sometime in the future. You know, we humans, we are, we are very limited. There's many things we can't do, and that makes some situations that we live in, some things that happen in this world, seem impossible for us to do. 
Have you ever faced a hopeless situation, a situation where you're ready to give up, you know, where you, where everything you did, you tried everything and it didn't work? Maybe the odds were so much against you or that you just wanted to give up. I don't know how many times in my life I've certain situations it just seems like I couldn't make it work and I did I just wanted to give up and I'm pretty sure Ezekiel felt the same way here he wanted to see a revival in the land he wanted his people he wanted his nation to return to God he wanted his people to be again the chosen but the people refused to repent the people refused to listen they refused to believe in and to live for God, their God, the Lord God. His ministry seemed for no good purpose. It's like he was wasting his time. So God lets Ezekiel know here that one day there would be a revival in the land. And this message here of this future revival conveys a hope and an encouragement that they all needed And we all need it too. For us today, this should be a message of hope. No matter how hopeless a situation may seem, there is a God who restores life. He is God Almighty. He's the one that made us. We have a God that can make even dry, old bones live again. Hallelujah. And we should keep that hope. Let's look at it here. A hopeless valley. In verse 1 of our text, Ezekiel begins to report on a a spiritual experience where God's Spirit placed him in a valley of dry bones. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. Now, He starts out with, the hand of the Lord was upon me. That's Ezekiel's usual expression, if you will, or way for him to to tell us that he has a divine vision, a vision from God. And it indicates a very powerful prophetic awakening and an inspiration that God gives to him. He was transported by the Spirit Spirit of the Lord to the middle of this valley, and this valley was full of dry human bones. His bones were dried and bleached, decayed, and scattered all over the place based on the description in God's Word. All about the prophet, who was completely surrounded by dry bones, dead bones. There was no life. And this represents the spiritual death of God's people. And this led to the death of the nation. Let's face it. Any nation is made up of the people that live there. Even though we claim the land is the nation, that's not really the nation. It's the people. Just like the church is not this building. The church is the people. It's people that make the church. It's people that make a nation. And because of death, people were dead. The nation was dead. Israel was a defeated nation. It had been crushed militarily. Its people had been separated from one another, from their homes and from one another in exile. Judah had suffered the result of abandoning the Lord. They had abandoned the Lord, and now they were suffering Because of that. But God, in his infinite wisdom and his infinite love, he had other plans. The one truly God in charge, he's in charge, he had something else in mind for his people that they couldn't even imagine possible. God still loved his people. They saw their situation. They saw what they were going through. They said, this is impossible. It was never going to be again. But God had a different plan. It didn't matter if they had forgotten God. God had not and would not forget his chosen people. He would accomplish his purpose 
for his glory by reviving his people. Brothers and sisters and friends and neighbors, let me tell you, God will always accomplish his purpose. He may do it differently because many of us are so weak and unwilling to obey God, but his purpose will be done. He's in charge. If he wants to use you and you refuse, guess what? There's others that will. God's purpose will be done. God calls Ezekiel here to inspect these bones in verse 2. It says, He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Now, God led Ezekiel here sort of on a tour, if you will, around the bones. Uh, I thought this was sort of funny if you think about it. Here God is taking Ezekiel. He's walking around the valley. I would feel very careful, you know, trying to walk and not step on a bone. I don't even like to step on people's graves. Do you like to be walking among all these bones, these human bones? I don't think you would. But God took Ezekiel and walked him around so that he could see the bones better, so he could have a very good understanding of them, a clear view of them. And basically, he was letting Ezekiel see if there's any life here. Is there anything here? Is there any way that these bones can come to life? So Ezekiel, he moves along the, around these scattered bones, and he's surprised by the number of bones lying in the valley, and he says they're, very dry. He didn't just say dry bones. He said very dry. Now this indicates that they were been dead for some time. This is a long time. These bones have been laying here for a very long time. And any human, any human suggestion that these bones could ever come to life again would be ridiculous. You and I would say, that's ridiculous. If we use just our logic, our human logic, our human understanding, there's no way these bones can ever live again. And there are also situations in our lives which appear to be totally, absolutely hopeless to us, to natural man. What is impossible to man is always possible with God. There's nothing impossible with God. So, life? Really? Life here? God then asked the prophet, he says, a, a very surprising question, I think, in verse 3. He asked him, he says, Hey, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel answered, Sovereign Lord, you alone, you alone, you know, can these bones live? Ezekiel's answer, I think, is filled with the awareness of his helplessness, human helplessness, the helplessness of mankind. We are helpless. Many things we cannot do, especially in the face of death. We cannot stop it. It's coming for all of us. Every one of us one day will face death. Think about this. Not too many chapters behind here, Ezekiel's uh, his beloved wife, she had been taken from him just a few chapters ago. And I'm sure that that loss was still pounding in his heart, that he was still upset about it. He was still hurting. But he also, he also had some respect for the unknowable power of God. That's why he said to him, Our oh Lord, you alone, you know. You see, what was the potential for life in these lifeless frames? What was it? Ezekiel knew that, humanly speaking, it was impossible. We can't do it. Ezekiel's answer revealed that it would require a power beyond man to bring about life. It was an answer of reverence. 
It was a reverent answer to God, realizing that the omnipotent power and the all wisdom of God, it was not a positive response, and it was not a negative response. It was a respectable response to God. God, only you know. Only you know. He knew that if these bones can live again, it was only if God made it so, and only God knew. He also knew that giving of life was a deed that only God could perform. Only God could bring these bones back to life. Not you, not me, not any man. You know, most Israelites may have doubted God's promise of restoration. So God stressed the fact of his sovereign power and his ability to carry out these remarkable promises that he was making through Ezekiel. He'd made all these promises to his people through Ezekiel, and they're, they're the, basically their fulfillment was based on God, was based on him, not on the circumstances, not on the people, not on the things. It was God. If anybody was going to do it, if it could be done, it had to be God. E Ezekiel knew that it was impossible for human power to revive these bones. But think about us for a minute. Think about us. As we come into contact with individuals today, we find it very often discouraging to try to bring people to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we not? When we're trying to witness for Jesus, when we're trying to tell people who are dead and lost in their sin, well, you and I, we can't help them. The only thing we can do is tell them what we know. I can't change them. I can't make them believe. I wish I could, but I can't. Many people are so dead to the great truth of Scripture that it's only when the Spirit of God, God Almighty, moves upon them that they can even understand a little bit of God's great truth. Let me tell you, if you understand anything in God's Word, it's because God gave you that understanding. And that's the reason I see so many people read Scripture, know Scripture, but they don't know what it means in their hearts. It never reached here. It got stuck up here. Because the Spirit has to put it here. Can they have spiritual life? Can these people who don't understand God's Word don't even want to hear it and even get angry when you tell them God's Word? Can they be saved? Can they be saved? Oh, Lord, you alone, you know, only God can change people's hearts. Only God can save them. Only God can can save all of us. If you're saved today, it's because God saved you, not because you did anything. In verse 4, God directs Ezekiel to prophesy to these dry, lifeless bones. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. God tells Ezekiel to prophesy over these bones. Ezekiel must have thought sort of many times in his ministry that he was preaching to the dead when he was preaching. Now he actually was preaching to the dead. He really was this time. The difference is, unlike his preaching in Israel and to the exiles, these bones would actually, actually respond to the word of the Lord. Sometimes, Dead things respond better than live things. He was told to address the dry bones and tell them to hear the word of the Lord. God's word is the way he raises to life 
and consecrates to service. I am saved by the word of the Lord. The word became flesh. Hallelujah. You can't separate the two. In verse 5, the other part of the formula for restoration to life is the dry bones is revealed. God said, I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. The word of the Lord was a promise to cause breath to enter into them that they might come to life. Breath. Breath could be translated wind or spirit. In our scripture, in the last verse there, uh, Ezekiel 37, 14, the same word is translated spirit. Same word. The act of breathing the breath of life into man is like the creation of man back in Genesis, Genesis 2, 7. In creating man, God transformed Adam into a living being by breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul when he did. Whether God was referring to wind or physical breath, the principle of life or the Holy Spirit is sort of uncertain here when he said that. However, the intent is very obvious. God is going to give life to these dead bones. God's Spirit is going to create life in these scattered dead bones. The dry bones represent the people's spiritually dead condition. The church or the nation or the people can seem like a heap of dead bones sometimes, in fact, they can seem that way to us most of the time. In fact, they may seem hopeless, dead, no hope of life. But just as God promised to restore his nation, he can restore any nation, he can restore any church, he can restore any life, no matter how dry or how dead it may be. Rather than give up like we want to do many times, we need to pray for revival. We need to pray for God to restore our church to life. The hope and prayer of every church should be that God would put his spirit into it and restore it to a very vibrant life. In fact, God is at work calling his people back to himself right now in order to bring life to a spiritually dead people and churches and nations. God's always calling to us. We must hear him and respond. And that's because of the breath of life, verse 7. Verse 7 records re remarkable results here of Ezekiel's life-giving prophecy. It says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Though prophesying over dry bones would appear to be uh, foolish, I think, to someone who had no faith, Ezekiel obeyed without comment, without complaining. Without doubt, as a matter of fact, seems like he didn't have any doubt either. The results of the word were sort of startling. While Ezekiel was preaching, a rumbling or a shaking started all over the valley. In the midst of the shaking or the thundering, the bones began to come together. At this point, if I was Ezekiel, I would be afraid. Would you not be afraid? Yeah, I probably would be. It was as though these bones, they were being guided by an intelligent design because the bones came together exactly the right way. They came away uh, to the proportions that make a normal human body, skeleton. How does that song go? Leg bone connected to the something bone? Anyway, we know that, right? but they were not alive. Even though these bones came together, they were not alive. And in verse 8, the, the rejoined bones come together by cartilage and muscle and flesh began to come out. He says, I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but 
there was no breath in them. As Ezekiel prophesied, these bones came together, and then the prophet looked and beheld that the bones had become skeletons, and then they were fitted with tendons and clothed with skin, and they looked marvelous with a, an appearance. Their skeletal appearance had gone, and now they had skin. They looked like regular bodies, but they were still dead. They weren't alive. They were just dead bodies. Now I'm wondering, would I be more scared now surrounded by dead bodies, or would I be more scared surrounded by dry bones? Think about that for a second. There was no breath in them. Although the bones came together, Ezekiel wisely didn't mistake commotion for regeneration. There was commotion, there was action, there was something going on, but they weren't whole. Even, even today, the flesh can do a lot of great activities, but true revival can't take place without the Spirit. Even today, lots of flesh, lots of people are doing things, but are they really alive or are they walking dead? Think about that. Revival cannot take place without the Spirit of God. Verse 9, Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the breath to inhabit the dead bones. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breathe from the four winds, breathe into these slain that they may live. Filled with God's breath, the bones can now come alive in verse 10. So I prophesied, and he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life, and they stood on their feet a vast army. I think that's a very dramatic transformation. They came from dry bones, death to life. God takes and turns a valley of dry bones into a living army. Such is the boundless power of the Word of God and the Spirit of the living God working together in His people. People who are dead, he makes us alive spiritually. Hallelujah. Because God's Spirit causes new life. God interpreted this vision that he gave Ezekiel. He told him what it represented. He says the vision was God's response to the people's sin and their hopeless condition. There will come a time when they see their destitute condition, they will understand how they are, who they are, and they will confess, they will confess that our bones are dried, that we are, have no hope. And when they do that, they'll realize that they are completely cut off. And these bones will wise up, and they are the house of God's people. Yes, these bones can live again, but unrepentant Israel was not able to make it so. Only God could do that. Only God can do it, and he would do so only based on his new covenant that he promised, if you remember, just back in the last three chapters, chapter 33, through 36. Do you remember? I've been preaching on those. Do you remember this new covenant? Remember God's promises of the new covenant there in, the, in 36, 25 through 28? He said that what he would do, he would sprinkle clean water on you, and you would be clean. He says, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Do you remember that? God said that he would give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. He will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He said that he will put his spirit within you and cause you to walk in his ways. Have you ever felt like 
the world you're living in is just falling in around you and there's no hope? You ever felt that way? Well, let me tell you something. Cheer up. I've got good news for you. In Christ, there is hope for the hopeless. In verse 12, God promises to bring his people back from the dead into the land of the living. And as a result of their confession of their hopeless condition, and their sin would be cut off, has cut them off from God. God is now ready to move on their behalf because they confess. He's ready to restore life to a nation that's dead in their sins. They are dead in their sins, but if they would confess, realize where they are, and come to God, he would restore them. When the impossible happens here in verse 13, records we will know that God did it. It says, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. Hallelujah. What a day that will be. Verse 14 promises a repentant re regeneration by the Holy Spirit. It says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. See, now it's very clear to me, and it should be to you, that the breath of life of these, that these corpses received symbolizes God's Spirit, His Holy Spirit. The work of regeneration is by the work and the agency of God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowered the dead, dry bones and gave them life gave them animation. It was the Word of God and the Spirit of God that made it all possible. As they work together in the life of a believer, they still do it today. If you are a Christian, a believer, then guess what? The Word of God and the Holy Spirit is working together in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to have both. We have God's salvation through the Word. We have regeneration by the Spirit. We have it. They're one. In conclusion, can these, these dead bones live? By the power of God's Holy Spirit, any who are dead in sin can live through faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The valley here of the dry bones typifies, I think, the, the human race as a whole. Because as a whole, we are we're exiled from God, our Creator, because of our sinfulness. And we're dead in our sins as a people. Without Christ, we are certainly dead in our sins. But we have the word of hope through our faith in Jesus Christ. That's our hope. You were once dead in sin. But when you cry out to God about your sin and how you cut off from Him and ask for a new life in Jesus' name and you're raised up and you're raised up to a new life by the power of the Holy Spirit just like Jesus' body was raised from the dead to life to the power of the Holy Spirit. We are raised to a new life to the power of the Holy Spirit. God has, has ever breathed new life. Has he ever breathed new life into you? That's my question I have for you. Has God breathed new life into you? If not, i got to tell you, there's never going to be a better time than right now. Right now is the time to do it. Let God breathe a new life into you. When you, come, when you come to God as the Spirit breathes His word of promise of new life into you, would you do that today? Would you give your life to God so that He can give you real life, so He can give you real hope? I pray that you do. I pray that you will. Let us pray. 
Our Father in heaven, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive us. We are ever bit like these dry bones, Lord. We are ever bit like them. We are, we are dead without, without you, Lord Jesus. We are dead in our sins. But Lord, you give us hope because you have not given up on us, Lord. You continue to call to us. And we hear your call and your spirit touches our hearts. Your, your spirit calls to us, Lord, and we come to you. And Lord, we pray for anyone who's not come to you, Lord. We lift them up to you right now. I ask, Lord, that you would breathe life into us all. That you would breathe a new life, an eternal life into us. And we would know you from the depths of our hearts. Yes, Lord, we were dead. We were all dead in our sins at one time. And Lord, we pray for renewal and renewal life. We pray for life that only you can give us because you are God Almighty and you're the only one that can do it. So we thank you, Lord, for that. Please, Lord, let it be so for your name's sake and for your glory, for it is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.